eukaryotes. We're going to focus in here on eukaryotic cells and organisms that are going to be important throughout this semester. Things from fungi, algae, protozoa, and helminths. So guys, we're going to look at Kingdom Protista first. Reclassification has been suggested for more kingdoms in this group Protista because Protista, guys, is kind of like the junk drawer of the kingdoms. You know that, that drawer you have in your house that just random stuff gets put in? Like if you need to find a pen, that's where you go, and then you end up finding out that five of them don't work, but instead of throwing them away, you just throw them back in the, in the drawer or if you need batteries or a lighter, whatever it might be. It kind of, everything gets thrown in there. Well, protista is kind of this. What happens with protista, if, if an organism does not fit as an animal, it doesn't fit as a plant, it doesn't fit as a fungus, but it is a eukaryotic cell, most of the time it gets thrown into this particular kingdom. So we're gonna look at algae, we're gonna look at protozoa, and we do see in protista, they are kind of put into groups, but these groups are not taxonomic groups. They are groups based on kind of characteristics. And we're going to look at algae again, protozoa, and water and slime molds. So guys, with algae, algae is the plant-like eukaryote that's in protista. They do photosynthesis. Most of them are unicellular, but some are multicellular. And these are the ones that we call seaweeds, like brown, red, green algae. They would all be part of this. Now, they are not plants. A lot of times people look at it as like kelp and things like that, and they're like, oh, well, those are plants in the ocean. No, they're not. They lack the tissues for true roots, stems, and leaves, so they cannot be classified as plants. They are categorized by their predominant photosynthetic pigment. So they are called green if the predominant pigment is green, brown, red. They also will be put into uh, categories based on their cell wall composition. So what's the significance? Why do we need to talk a little bit about algae? Well, economically, they are the producers in the food chain when we're talking about the ocean. They're the phytoplankton is the food for the zooplankton. And so they are kind of the basis of the food chain when we look at the marine environment. Economically, we do see that they have lots of different uses. Brown algae or seaweed is used in foods, and a lot of times they're used in foods as thickeners. So for like cake decorating type of uh, things like fondant and stuff like that, as well as ice cream. Red algae is also a seaweed and it's used in food. It's also used to make auger that we use in the microbiology labs. These are more of like the purpose of gelatinous type of structures where we want to make it more jelly-like. Sometimes even like that coating that's on medication that helps you swallow it better is part of is made out of these types of algae. Some of these algaes produce toxins. So example is dinoflagellates. They're associated with what we call algal blooms. They cause red tides. They produce a neurotoxin and this causes paralytic shellfish poisoning. Also in this group protista, there are the protozoas. The protozoas are the animal-like heterotrophic eukaryotes, so they act kind of like animals, but they don't have the true characteristics to be an animal. Now, there are some exceptions. Euglenoids and dinoflagellates also do photosynthesis, so they are kind of on the cusp here. They kind of are like algae, but they're kind of like protozoa as well. These guys are unicellular. The reservoir or where they come from varies. They could be found in environmental water and soil samples. They could be found in the gut of mammals. They're located in lots of different areas. There are relatively few of these actually cause disease. And if they do, normally the human is an accidental host. They didn't really wanna get inside the human. They just accidentally got in there and then they made you sick. There's like two form variations when we're talking about uh, protozoas. There's an assist type of variation, and this is the infective or dormant stage that we see with protozoa. And there's what we call the trophozyte stage, which is the feeding and growing stage. So you can see that they go back and forth. You can see the double arrows. There's a constant back and forth between these two stages. Cysts are to protozoa as the endospores are to bacteria. So remember we talked about bacteria can make endospores where they can be dormant and it protects them against the environment. The cyst structure can protect the protozoa in the same way. 
All right, we do want to take a look at some of these groups and particularly the ones that make us sick when we talk about the protozoa. Now, protozoa most of the time are going to be categorized by how they move. What kind of motility do they use? And so this first mode of locomotion that we're going to look at is the flagella, so the tail-like extension. There's several groups that are going to be clinically significant when we talk about pathogens that are part of this flagella group. And the first one we see is Giardia lamblia. Giardia lamblia causes diarrhea and it does get transmitted through the fecal oral route. And so this is going to be through the digestive system. We also have Trichomonas vaginalis. It causes vaginitis, so inflammation of the vagina. And this particular one would be transmitted through sexual transmission, sexual contact. So that is going to be an issue with the reproductive system. We also have a, a group called the hemoflagellates. They are going to be the parasites that like blood. So the hemo tells you that they like blood. And the first one we see is the leishmania. These are going to invade tissues and they actually get injected through bites of sand flies. So they're going to be found in the gut of the sand fly and when it bites you, it would be transported to you. It's going to, again, get into your cardiovascular system and lymphatic systems. Leishmania causes a lot of like sores and deep infections. The trypanosomas, these cause a disease like African sleeping sickness. That one's going to be passed on to humans through the tsetse fly and also chagogs, which is going to be passed on through the kissing bug. These two are going to cause major issues again in the cardiovascular system and lymphatic system. But the problem with a trypanosoma type of protozoa is that they like to hide in plain sight. They allow your immune system to see that it does not belong and your immune system starts making a response against it to fight it. But by the time your immune system is ready to fight it, it now has changed how it looks. It's still not hiding. It's not going away. It's like, hey, I'm here and I don't belong here, but now it looks different. So your immune system has to come up with a different way to fight it. This causes your body to get really tired. And that's one of the things with African sleeping sickness. When we look at modes of locomotion, we also have them using a pseudopod, that's that false foot, in order to move from one place to the other. And the group here are the amoebas. When we look at the amoebas, they are going to potentially cause some diseases, such as amoebic dysentery. Amoebic dysentery is caused by a specific amoeba, Entamoeba histolytica. Another one called Neglaria is going to cause meningocephalitis. So this one will actually transport into the nervous system. So the first example with amoebic dysentery is the digestive system. And then we also see that it can affect the nervous system. And this particular and Neglaria is going to be transmitted through contaminated water, just like amoebic dysentery would be. Another group is going to be non-motile. They don't actually have the ability to move from one place to another on their own. So they're going to utilize, again, vectors. This group is called the Ampicomplexia, and they get this name because they have a super complex life cycle. They actually move between more than one host in their life cycle. And they are intracellular parasites throughout pretty much the whole cycle. Plasmodomia is one group, and this group is responsible for causing malaria. This is going to be transmitted specifically by mosquitoes and it's going to be through the species anaphylaxis mosquitoes. We also have the toxoplasma. This is going to be given to you through ingestion. It also invades your tissues and gives you flu-like symptoms. The cryptosporidium is going to cause diarrhea and it is going to enter through the digestive system through the fecal oral route. So again, a big issue with this guys, when we talk about the fecal oral route that you've seen on several of these is you need to wash your hands after you go to the bathroom because you potentially, if you're infected, could then spread it to others, but also back to yourself. The last type of locomotion that we see here are the ciliates and the ciliates have the little um, hair-like extensions that move back and forth. One example that can cause diarrhea, and it's the only known human parasite that's part of the ciliates, is Valentidium coli. Now, we talked about algae, we talked about the protozoa. The protozoa is the big group that's going to be an issue when we talk about microbiology with sickness. But we also have the water and slime molds. The water and slime molds are part of 
pro protista as well, um, but they're the fungus-like heterotrophic eukaryotes. They produce spores in sporangia similar to what fungus does, but again, they lack a lot of the structures that a normal fungus would have. So they don't get to actually be part of the fungus group. They're just fungus-like. Water molds like Omicata are going to be decomposers and they are associated sometimes with crop failures. One example of one of these that kind of got out of control is when 1 million people died in Ireland due to that potato famine that they had in the mid 1800s. That potato famine was caused by a type of water mold that killed those potato crops. Slime molds are also decomposers and they can be in two kind of forms. They can have a cellular form or a plasmodomal form and they exhibit kind of amoeboid like movement when they're in that plasmodomal form. Now let's talk about kingdom fungi. This is going to be called mycology when we're actually studying fungi specifically. Some general characteristics of the kingdom fungi are that they are heterotrophic. They're going to consume their own food. They are eukaryotes. They have a cell wall the cell wall is mostly made out of chitin or chitin and we see that they produce spores in order to reproduce. Now they do have some vegetative structures. The vegetative structures for molds means that they are multicellular. Hyphae are these kind of filament like structures that are going to be present. They can have septae in them which are cross walls to where they are like blocked off like you can see over here or they can have a septae which means they don't have any cross bridges or blocks so they don't have the septum. Mycelium is when a group of hyphae are put together. So collectively, if there's a bunch of hyphae together, we would call that mycelium. Vegetative hyphae are gonna function to obtain their nutrients. So this means they're gonna obtain their nutrients normally by absorbing it. Aerial hyphae function more for reproduction. They're going to create spores. Now, one thing with fungus is they can create this, these spores either sexually or asexually. So you can see the difference. We see the vegetative will normally be under the soil or in the media and it's gonna be absorbing nutrients. And the aerial hyphae is in the air and it's gonna be releasing the spores so that the fungus can spread. Now, types of spores that are produced asexually through mitosis can be the conidia spores are spores which are not enclosed in any sacs, which you can see here. They are just going to be linked together. There's no sac or structure around those spores. The arthrocondidia are going to be where there are fragments of septi hyphae that are going to be released. Okay, so they fragment and they break off, the hyphae break off, and that's how they're producing their spores. The blastidio condidia are going to be made by uneven budding. So if you look here, there's a budding process that occurs, but instead of being half and half, one is a lot larger than the other. The clamio condidia are going to have spores within their hyphae. Inside of each of the hyphae, they'll have some spores that are present. And then we have the sporangiospores. They are going to have their spores actually enclosed in a specialized sac. So why are molds significant, especially clinically. Well, when we look at this, guys, we see that we have what we call the sporangiospores are going to be found in things like rhizopus. Rhizopus underneath the microscope have these kind of lollipop looking heads and they're going to have the spores inside. Rhizopus is the main type of mold or fungus that causes bread mold, black bread mold. The condidia spores are the condidia. An example of this is aspergillus. Aspergillus has more of a dandelion-like head structure microscopically. We also see that we have the microcondidia, which are the small ones, and these are all mostly responsible for uh, dermatophytes or causing infections on the skin itself. An example of this would be ringworm. When we look at yeast, guys, yeast is a unicellular fungus. It does not have the little filaments that we saw with the hyphae. These guys are going to produce also through asexual reproduction through the process of budding. Some will actually produce germ tubes and they are going to have what we call these pseudo hyphae. Remember, pseudo means false. So they don't actually have hyphae, but it looks like they're starting to develop hyphae. We can ID these yeasts by biochemical testing, specifically how they ferment and utilize sugars for energy. The clinical significant yeasts that are important are going to be Canada albicans, Cryptococcus, and Pneumocytus. 
So these are the ones that are kind of clinically significant yeasts that we will be looking at throughout the semester. Now, if you look here in these pictures, you'll see that there's some budding as well as the germ tubes and what looks like the pseudo hyphae. We also see that we can use negative staining. The next, the next we wanna look at is dimorphic fungi. Dimorphic fungi actually have a pretty high medical importance. When we look at dimorphic fungi, they can grow as a mold with the hyphae and the filaments if it is 25 degrees Celsius. So when it's kind of, when it's colder and they're in an in vitro type of environment, they're gonna grow like a mold. However, they can also grow like a yeast if the temperature is warmer, if it's like 37 degrees Celsius. So this is why they're considered dimorphic because they can go back and forth, di means two. So they can grow either way. They can look more like a mold type fungus or they can look more like a yeast. So blastomyces, histoplasma, coccidioides, and sporothics can do these, can go between the two forms, the mold and the yeast. So guys, when we look at the phyla in fungus, these are named by structures that produce spores through sexual reproduction, okay? So we were looking at asexual reproduction previously. Now we're gonna look at sexual reproduction. We have the telomorphs, and these are the ones that are gonna produce spores sexually and asexually, because a lot of our fungus can actually do both. So we have the zygomycota. These are gonna produce zygospores, and this is what we see with black bread mold. They're gonna be aseptae, meaning they in their hyphae they don't have septae, and they're gonna produce these spores in a special structure that they call the sporangia. But in this particular case, you can see that there's a part that is gonna have the sexual reproduction. Now, rhizopus gets the name in microbiology as the lid raisers. A lot of times, if, a, if we're trying to grow bacteria on a plate, if it gets contaminated with a fungus and the fungus grows and actually causes the lid to pop up on the Petri dish, it's more, li more than likely a rhizopus type of fungus. And that's why they get that name, the lid raisers. And we also have the ascomycota. These are going to produce spores in a sac-like um, area called the ascus. When we look at this, this is the part that's the sexual reproduction, and they also contain some anamorphs. Anamorphs have no sexual life cycle that's demonstrated, but they still are part of this group. The anamorphs are also, or used to be known as, the imperfect fungi, and they had an old phyla name called Deuteromycota. Now this group of this imperfect fungi is actually very medically important because this is the group that penicillin comes from. The basidiomycota or the basidia is the club-like fungus and this is maybe what you think of when you think of a fungus right off the bat when you're like, oh, a mushroom in that sense. On the underside of those mushroom, inside those little gills or slits, there's gonna be these club-like structures in the basidia and that's where they're going to produce their spores through sexual reproduction. Now, the reason we're talking about fungus, just like when we talked a little bit about the protozoa and the, or the protista and specifically the protozoa, is that some of these fungi can actually make us sick. When a fungus makes us sick, it's called a mycosis. And mycosis can either be deep-seated, like you see in the first picture, where it starts as a skin infection, but it goes deeper and it starts to become systemic, like we see here with the blastomycosis, or it can be very superficial and more on the surface like we see with the ringworm. The ringworm, because it's more on the surface, it's cutaneous, we call those more the dermatophytes. Now, the difference here though is how deep it is. So a cutaneous is more in the skin and nails, subcutaneous means it's gone deeper beneath the skin, and systemic means it's spreading to other tissues and organs. A lot of these fungi are going to be considered opportunistic. They're usually harmless, but if they get the opportunity to make you sick, then they can become pathogenic. So if they get the opportunity to get under your skin, they could make you sick. And one example of this is oral thrush. And a lot of times you hear, you see kids have oil, oral thrush because this fungus and these spores are on surfaces. And how do kids explore the world? Well, they put things in their mouth. Okay, and so you see this a lot of times in younger children, especially when they are constantly sticking things in their mouth. So what are some of the economic effects of fungi? Well, they're used to make food and beverages. A lot of different fungus can be used to help make food and beverages. They're also useful in pest control. 
We do see though that they can cause issues and kill trees. We see that in tree blight with like Dutch elm disease. They are also responsible for food spoilage. If you've ever bought food and you get, got too much of it, and especially like fruits or vegetables that were fresh, they start to get that mold and fuzziness that's on them. That fungus has caused them to spoil. Some of these fungi actually produce natural antibiotics that we can hopefully use and exploit in that sense and give it to help us be able to have protection. We see that we also can use fungus in biotechnology. They've been used to make vaccines and even potentially developing anti-cancer drugs. So if we look here though, which one of these are positive and which ones are negative? Well, obviously making food is positive. Pest control is positive. What about tree blights like Dutch elm disease? Well, disease tells you it's negative. Food spoilage is also negative. Production of antibiotics is positive, and the use of biotechnology is also positive. So in reality, this fungus has kind of more positive economic effects than it potentially does negative. Factors that make fungus different than bacteria, specifically if we're wanting to try to grow them in a lab, okay? So this is where we're looking at growth factors. Some take longer to grow on media than bacteria does. Bacteria has a very fast growth rate for the most part, especially if you give them everything they need. Fungus may need to take a little bit longer. Fungus also thrives in a more acidic condition, more at a pH of five. Molds typically are aerobic, meaning they need oxygen in order to create that ATP and energy, whereas yeasts are gonna be more of doing fermentation, which means they don't want the oxygen. They're more anaerobic. We see that fungus is more resistant to osmotic lysis. They, are, they have a strong cell wall with the chitin, and so they can grow on jellies and on salt-preserved foods, whereas other bacteria may not be able to grow there. They can also grow in a lower humidity, where there doesn't have to be as much water present. And they produce enzymes that break down more complex sugars or carbohydrates. When we talked about bacteria earlier. Remember, most bacteria can only really use monosaccharides, the very simple sugars in order to grow. Some of them have special enzymes for dye and polysaccharides. When we look at fungus, most of them have very good enzymes to break down complex chemical sugars. So what does this mean to a microbiologist? So what, how does this affect us if we're gonna be looking at fungus versus bacteria? Well, doctor's orders need to be specific if they want fungal cultures because the culture and the media needs to be different for a fungus than it would be for a bacteria. Because we use special media to accommodate that growth of the fungus, the orders need to say that. We also need to keep cultures for a longer period of time when we're looking at fungus. We're not going to see growth necessarily after 24 hours. It might take longer. And we've also got to use different methods to identify fungus. We can't use gram staining and things like that like we talked about earlier with bacteria. We're going to have to use different methods. The last group we want to talk about in the eukaryotes are going to be the kingdom animalia. The general characteristics of organisms in animalia are going to have, they're going to be multicellular. There's no single celled animal. They're also heterotrophic, consuming their food, and all of their cells are eukaryotic cells, meaning they have the nucleus and organelles. The group we're going to focus in on here in animalia are the helminths. So these are going to be the parasitic worms. These are highly specialized animals, a very complex life cycle, and their complex life cycle normally involves multiple hosts. Now many of these worm parasites are going to actually be intestinal parasites. So they're going to want to get into your digestive system and specifically into the intestines. One group we want to look at are the platyminthes. Platyminthes are the flatworms. So when we're looking at the flatworms, we have the trematodes, which are going to be like your flukes. Now flukes are going to be, again, flatworms, and they are going to specifically get named based on the location they prefer. Some of them like the blood, so they're blood flukes. Others like the lungs, and others still like the liver. So it depends on what organ they would prefer is going to help us know what kind of fluke we're looking at. We also have the cestoids. The cestoids are going to be your tapeworms. These are going to be dog, beef, and pork tapeworms. Now these are flatworms, but it does not mean that they're necessarily super small. When we look at flukes, a lot of times they can be pretty small and maybe even microscopic, but they may grow pretty large. 
tapeworms can be longer than you. They can be longer than your intestines. Your intestines can be up to like 10 feet long. These guys might be that long as well. Okay, they can actually grow very large in size in the sense of their length, but they are going to be flat and pretty small in that sense. They're like ribbon-like worms. Now these are parasites and if you look, the tapeworm's head not something you really want to have in your body. It has these hooks that helps it hold on to your, your intestines because as your intestines moves food through, it doesn't want to get lost. And it is able to then absorb the food you have digested. This is why it is a parasite. Nematodes, however, are going to be your roundworms. So some examples of this are what we call the hookworms. The hookworms, some species that potentially are issues for us are ancylostomas and and the caters. Another roundworm that causes issues is another one is Ascaris lumbercoides. We also have pinworms, Enterobius vermicularis, and Trichinella spiralis. The last worm here are the whipworms, which are Trichilurus trichicura. Moving on though, these guys are not the only ones that potentially cause us problems with the worms. They are the ones that are the parasites, but arthropods can become an issue when we're talking about microbiology in the sense that they're the ones who carry a lot of these other organisms we talked about. Arthropods can be vectors and they can move bacteria, viruses, and even protozoas from one organism to another and they can end up infecting you through bites. Now arthropods have jointed appendages with segmented bodies. They also have that hard exoskeleton. Now arthropods can be arachnids, which means they have eight legs. And so these are going to be things like spiders, ticks, scorpions, but ticks are one of these that can be vectors. They can actually trans transmit Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, Lyme disease, and aerolochylosis. Mites are another one. They rarely transmit disease to humans, but they are a nuisance and they do cause skin irritations. This is known as scabies. They could also elicit allergic reactions or responses. An example of that would be dust mites. Insects, however, have six legs. They are six leg legged. Some examples that cause us issues are lice. This can be an epidemic typhus. Fleas, they can also cause endemic marine typhus or even plague. Mosquitoes, they carry things like malaria, dengue fever, yellow fever, heartworm, and arboroviruses. Flies can also carry some of these, and these are going to be flies that bite. And so we have the tsetse fly here carries African sleeping sickness. And then also other bugs like the kissing bug can carry Chagog's disease. Okay, the kissing bug gets its name, guys, because it is, it is attracted to carbon dioxide, which means it gets attracted to your mouth or nose, um, especially when you're sleeping, because then you're not going to mess with it or know that it's necessarily there. It will crawl and it will then start, to, it'll bite. Now the bite is actually what not what infects you with the Chagog's disease, it's the feces. It also is going to end up defecating on you and then you end up getting it into the sore and it causes a problem. So these are some vectors. So if we can control them, we can potentially control how these diseases are going to spread.